Guys, guys, what is that? My foot's caught on something. What the hell is that? Guys! Whoa, what the hell is this? Whoa! 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 Hello everyone, the December Review here, back again with a movie review. Today, we have the recently released reboot of Wrong Turn, directed by Mike P. Nelson and written by series creator and writer of the original film, Alan McElroy. Does the reboot live up to the charm of the first movie, or does the seventh film in the franchise run out of gas? Minor spoilers ahead, and while you're here, please subscribe to the channel for more. I appreciate it. Let's grab some popcorn and check things out. Eh, it's a little dry. Must be yesterday's popcorn. Always happens to me. <laughs> Jennifer Shaw, played by Charlotte Vega, is with a group of friends who go wandering out on the Appalachian Trail a hiking adventure near a small town in Virginia. Despite warnings from the townsfolk, they veer off path and find themselves in harm's way. Dodging traps with varying degrees of success, the group is eventually held captive by the lurkers in the woods, who live by their own set of rules and laws. Jen's father, Scott Shaw, played by Matthew Modine, hasn't heard from her in six weeks and begins to trace her steps back to this town, eventually visiting the area and looking for information. A bit of an overlooked series, the original film led by Eliza Dushku came out in 2003 and was a solid enough hit. That film focused on the usual trapped in the woods shenanigans, playing things a bit closer to Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes, while adding in some pretty neat FX work. Through the years, there would be five sequels finding a nice horror niche within the horror community. Getting the reboot treatment here, one would expect the usual fare we've already seen before. I can happily report that not only does this new Wrong Turn film not carbon copy the original, but it manages to take the concept of the series and turn it on its head, bringing in new ideas and flushing out its world into near epic levels of Lost in the Woods storytelling. The film starts off with Scott and his family perhaps over worrying why he hasn't heard from Jen, who has gone on a sabbatical to clear her mind before deciding on her future. We then rewind six weeks to where the trip started. We meet the usual gang of friends doing the typical obnoxious road trip partying and conversations. They settle into a motel and are repeatedly warned by staff and patrons at a bar to not head into the mountains off the trail. The bar scene is an extended shot where the kids are loud and a bit disruptive to the locals. Adam is the hothead of the group, throwing a bottle at a stranger at one point and generally being a jerk. It's here where the script starts taking its own veered-off path. The locals and the friends clash over generational issues, a plot device on the surface that may seem cliched, but in a very smart move, everything being discussed in this scene comes back to mean something. And much to my surprise, everything isn't as it seems or like you were meant to believe especially if you watch these types of films already. The early town shots also establish a connection with other members of the town, most of whom come back to mean something down the road themselves. What I enjoyed about this connection is, again, we've seen this countless times before. Just about every Texas Chainsaw film or Rob Zombie movie tells us never to trust the ones you meet first. And while I won't spoil any of the reveals, the actions and motivation of a few wasn't what I was expecting which is a huge strength of this film, subverting expectations while also working in an established reality. So of course, the group decides to take a detour once they get to hiking. This sets up a rather intense moment where they end up fleeing over a massive rolling tree headed their way. Game set and match as they are now officially in over their heads. If you have seen the original, then you know. The ones behind the chicanery were some mutant cannibals hell-bent on bloody destruction. Well, that's not the case here. Things are dressed up like the original with its forest and hiking trails. 
but lurking this time around are a different set of circumstances, one that doesn't take too kindly to strangers. The film's arc is noble for its scope, a rarity in the genre where we get our setup, then our misadventure in the woods. Then we get the capture, the reveal, and an ending, and then maybe about three more endings on top of that. Clocking in at just under two hours, Wrong Turn is a marathon, not a sprint. And I found myself feeling as if I just ran one once the screen finally faded to black. It's a credit to the filmmakers for going the extra distance here, not relying on the same old tropes to get from point A to point B. Sure, there are plenty of the been there, done that type of situations, but the film's narrative and pulse is much more far reaching than any of the other films in the series thus far more than many recent horror films I have seen recently overall. Perhaps taking a bit of a nod from Midsummer and The Hunger Games, this reboot is aiming for the long game and wants you to stick around until the final frame is shown. The acting from our leads is on point. Charlotte Vega does an excellent job as Jennifer. Her character gets to stretch out here and once she hits survival mode, she becomes one of the better heroes in horror that I've seen in a while. Her early humanity to the town folk sets up her fate just well enough to keep her alive for another day. Matthew Modine does great as well as the father who won't stop until he finds his daughter. He plays the won't take no for an answer type for a while, but gets sidekicked once the finale hits. This allows Jennifer to take over, and the connection between the two elevates the movie and gives the audience, us, an invested interest. Tim DeZarn does a great job as well as the local who confronts our group early on, then pops back in once Scott shows up. His character is thoughtfully crafted and an excellent surprise. Dylan McTee as Adam plays the scoundrel role well, seemingly causing havoc for the group with each misstep that he takes. Bill Sage plays Venable, the main bad guy and leader of the Foundation. He is threatening, deadly, and one to be feared, but once again, the script finds a way to make his actions come off with a purpose, at least to him and his followers. He is played calm and subdued, which is much more convincing than, say, a raving lunatic cannibal monster. The direction is well done as well. Mike Nelson has a great eye for the woods locale and uses it to his advantage. The day scenes are shot extremely well and the nighttime chaos never gets too dark or shaky where we couldn't see all the action. There are some great reaction shots that tighten the tension throughout the film. The foundation setting for the film feels vast and scary as it sits atop this mountain overlooking its kingdom. The trial scene in the cave is a standout and is handcrafted with plot revelations and fear. He also adds in one particular jump scene that involves a snake, and even though jump scenes are so cliché, this one is done extremely well. Almost too well, because it got me. It got me good. And I end up laughing out loud uh, and have to give a slight nod of approval. Well played, sir. Okay, if I can get that snake out of there, maybe I can reach Adam, okay? And do what? He's still caught on that chain. What if he's hurt? Maybe this hole connects to an old mine or something. We can look for an entrance and, okay. and then we... How long do you want to look? An hour? Two? All day? That chain goes somewhere! I know! Somebody put it there! Alan McElroy must also be commended for writing this clever and epic tale. He takes the foundation, no pun intended, of the original but doesn't just reboot it for the sake of being trendy and sticking closely to its predecessor. He takes the spark of the idea and crafted a completely different spin on the subject matter. Underneath the horror elements lies a smart script, where the setup and payoffs combine to drag the audience around with these characters and gives them a rooted interest. It's also worthy to note that everyone here has a motivation vested in goodwill, Obviously, the group of friends are mostly nice enough people who happen to make a mistake, but the foundation is written to be sympathetic as well. Hearing Venable speak of their intentions, one could assume their way of living should be left alone. Well, that is except for the fact that they are eye-gouging lunatics underneath it all, but to them, 
It's medieval theatrics, the law of the land. The townsfolk as well circle back to show some compassion throughout the runtime. This takes the story from just being another gore fest, and instead it now holds some weight. Being a wrong turn film, one would expect a certain level of gore, and this one doesn't shy away. There are numerous levels of carnage throughout the film. It does hold back from time to time, allowing for the end results to be more frightening with just that little bit of extra anticipation. Overall, Wrong Turn 2021 is an excellent horror tale. I was expecting another no-brainer Lost in the Woods shock fest, but instead, I watched an extremely well-made and smart genre story that kept its foot on the gas all the way through. The final act of the story is exceptional, and by the time the credits rolled, I needed to shake my mind from all of the carnage. There are nods to the original, along with a little bit of Midsummer sprinkled in for reference. But this wrong turn reboot doesn't waste anyone's time or money just looking to cash in on a popular horror title. Instead, it paves its own new story and its relentless one at that. I recommend Wrong Turn 2021 and give it 4 out of 5 stars. It's a story people know but don't talk about. Except in whispers, like a ghost story. We don't bother them, and they don't bother us. But anyone who goes up there... What is this place? Guys! 